Just before we start the episode, here's a trailer for another podcast. If you like what you hear, go and check it out. Welcome to my true crime podcast, Stolen From Me. Every week we will cover a different case, from the notorious Ian Huntley to the gruesome Ed Gain. You can follow me for more episodes and news on my Twitter page, at Stolen From Me Pod. I got into true crime from an early age. I was around eight years old at the time, and at school we had to write to someone famous. Everybody decided to write to the Queen, but I didn't want to do that, so I decided I was going to write to the Cray Twins. This didn't go down well, but it did escalate in my fascination of true crime. Thank you for being a part of my podcast. Please leave a five-star review, like and subscribe, and see you in the next episode. Hi, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is Crime Divers. Hello. Hello. Anybody fancy a wee quickie? A what? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Just a wee bonus episode, a wee quick oh, one. That sounds better. <laughs> well, let's I know, before you start, oh, oh. I have some true crime news oh, that I found out this week. Right. So do you remember when I covered the case um, called Murder in the Lane about the, the men that got the, shot in the Land Rover? Yeah, no, yeah. So, you know, there was two guys that got convicted for it. Yeah. Well, now apparently they're saying that they think they've got the wrong guys. <gasps> You're kidding? No, apparently some... Obviously, I can't really remember names because I, I just briefly read it. But some other guys come out and, and say that actually he said it was his dad that killed them. So I don't, wow. know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen there. I don't know if uh, they're going to, you know, take it seriously or not. But... Uh, well, you're going to have to There is some doubt. Mm, yeah. So just uh, I'll keep my eye on it. And if I see any further... Really They'll keep us stuff. updated. Absolutely. Yeah. I thought, well, that's quite interesting because from what I had researched, it was quite a. It was definitely them that had done it. So, no, well, there's obviously a bit of doubt there now. Wow. I know. Oh. I like it when I find stuff out like that. I know. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said, keep us updated on that. Imagine if it is the wrong people, though. I know. Because then I would have to. Oh, I don't know. I can't re research a case, can I? But <laughs> I wouldn't have the right outcome because then somebody that might listen to it might think, hey, she's talking nonsense. Well. <laughs> We could put... Oh, no. no. Oh, I don't know what we're going to well, do. Well, anyway, I see. If I, if I People will just have to listen to all of our episodes and then they will know. Well, exactly. That's true. But yeah, so there, so there you go. A wee, a wee fun... Well, not a fun fact, but a wee... No, yeah. I know. A bit, a bit of news for you today, so... Cool. There you go. Oh, anyway, well. sorry. You carry on. Where, where, where are we today for our little bonus episode? Well, do you want to know the title? Oh, do we not know the title yet? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. The title... I didn't get a ever. chance because you jumped sorry. in. I know, but I was, I was trying to say it before I forgot about yeah, it. Yeah, so. that's fine. So this episode is called Peekaboo ICU. Oh, I like that title. <laughs> that is a good title. A bit creepy. That does sound a bit creepy. Yeah, actually. this is a bit creepy. I'm going to get creeped out. Well, I think it's a bit creepy. All right, okay, well. So and that. where we are, we are in Massachusetts, USA. Ooh. So, should we dive in? Let's dive in for our quickie. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus episode, thank you. Keep it clean. <laughs> Keep it clean. Yeah. We are, uh, so we're in 1986 in Massachusetts. Did I say that right? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. It's quite a hard word to I'm, say. Yeah. I'm, I um, so, um, uh, sorry. Annie Andrews was a 15-year-old girl who lived with her dad, Brian, and her younger sister, Jessica. Their mum had passed away quite recently after a long battle with cancer. Right. One day, Annie received a phone call and it was from a boy called Daniel LaPlante. I'm not quite sure how he got her number, but she, I think she'd assumed that someone from school had given him it. Right, okay. Because, you know, that's what we did back then. Oh, well, there wasn't mobiles, was there? No, if you liked somebody, you were like, oh, couldn't yeah. find out their number. Yeah, yeah phone. definitely. So she, she didn't know him, but he said that he'd seen her and he thought she was really pretty, so he wanted to get to know her. Mm-hmm. So they started to chat regularly on the phone and... He, he told her that he went to a different school. He lived in the in the same area, but he went right. to a different school. Okay. And he described himself as blonde, good-looking, athletic, and well-educated. 
So they eventually, after chatting for a while, get to know each other, they went out on a date. They, uh-huh. Well, they decided to go out on a date. Yeah. But when Annie answered the door to him, she had clearly been catfished. Oh dear. <laughs> the boy on her doorstep was dark haired, greasy looking, oh. and unattractive. Right. But she must have been a nice person because she still decided to go on the date with him. I'm not Maybe sure. Maybe she got sorry for him. Well, yeah, I'm not sure I would have done the same. No. But she did. She was obviously not a bitch. Yeah. So then they went to, there was a nearby carnival, so they, they went to that. Mm-hmm. But Annie, she wasn't, she, she wasn't feeling it. No. Um, she said that she had told Daniel about her mum passing away mm-hmm. and he seemed to be like way too interested in the details. Right. Like he asked Annie how she felt at the moment that she was told that her mum had passed. Well, that's a bit personal. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't ask people that, do you? Yeah. No, definitely And not. even worse, I think, is he also asked her how much did her mum suffer? Oh. Now, that's just No, that's, that's awful. way too much. Like, you, you don't ask that to somebody. That's no, awful. That's not a that's not a conversation you should be having. No. Mm-hmm. Definitely not, not. Especially with somebody you don't even know. Well, exactly. That's even worse. And she later said it was as if Daniel was obsessed with the death of her mum. Right. So she didn't stay long on the date and uh-huh. they didn't see each other again. Well, I don't blame her, to be honest. No. So at some point after that, I don't know don't know what sort of time differences, but um, Annie and her sister Jessica decided to have a seance in their basement. <laughs> <laughs> idea. Yeah. Um because they were missing their mum and they wanted to talk to her. I don't think they really believed in it, but they you know they, they just want to try. Yeah, they want to try it. Mm. So, you know, that teenagers do that. It's yeah, like I, I tried like. I tried like a Ouija board. Yeah. I, I don't been there, done that. Yeah. Didn't no. work. No, it didn't work. So that night when they went to bed after the seance, they both heard knocking on their bedroom walls. So they believed that the seance had actually been successful. Right. So in the middle of the night, the girls were talking to what they thought was their mum because they were, like, asking questions mm-hmm. and they were replied to by knocks on the wall. You know, obviously, like, one knock for yes. Oh, and, right, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And this continued for a few more nights, but the knocking became so often that it, that it started disturbing the girls' sleep. Uh-huh. And then over time, objects in the house would disappear and, like, items that were on tables or shelves would end up on the floor. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they would come home and the furniture was moved, like, from one side of the room to the other. All right. And eventually the girls believed that they were being haunted by some other spirit. You know, not a yeah. very nice spirit. No, it wasn't their mum. Not their mum, no. No, there, it was something not very nice. Mm-hmm. But their dad, Brian, he just thought it was the girls who were doing all this stuff. He just thought they were maybe acting out, you know, due to their mum's yeah, death. That they were maybe that. wanting attention. Yeah. And they, they told him it was a ghost, but he just, he, di- he didn't believe them. Right. So one night in 1987, the girls were home alone, uh, Brian was at work, mm-hmm. and the knocking started again, but this time the noises were coming from the basement mm-hmm. and not from the walls like usual. Right, okay. So they each grabbed a kitchen knife, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And they went down to the basement, and on the wall, there was a message, and it was written in blood. Oh, God. It said, I'm in your room, come and find me. Oh my god. So. Oh, I don't know how I'd react if I seen something like that. Well, obviously they shit themselves. I was shouting, Dad! <laughs> and they ran, well, he wasn't there, was he? He was, oh, well. he was at work. So they, they shit themselves, they ran out of the house and they went to a neighbour's, mm-hmm. which I think I probably would have done that. So yeah. I'd do that now. Yeah. <laughs> um, they phoned their dad, Brian, and he came home, but he was annoyed. He was. He just still thought that that they were acting out. Uh-huh. Maybe because he was working quite a lot, and yeah, yeah. as I said, just for attention. Yeah. But he, so he arranged counselling for them. All right. Okay. Um. So there was a few weeks later. The girls were home alone again, and they heard knocking. This time coming from Annie's room. Right. They went in her, into her room, and there was a message on her wall, written in blood. Uh-huh. It said, "I'm back. Find me if you can." Ooh, again, goosebumps. <laughs> again, they shut themselves. Yeah, and they ran to the neighbor's house. Uh-huh. The neighbor phoned Brian and told them that the girls were really freaked out, and you know they didn't think that they were just mucking about. They really thought the, the, the girls something. are scared. There's yeah. something going on. Uh-huh. So he came home and he just like marched into the house to prove that there was nobody there. Mm. But it was clear someone was, as it wasn't as the girls had described it. They must have told him what it kind of looked like, but right. it must have been worse or you know something must have changed yeah he knew it's yeah. changed so you know they must have done more stuff since uh-huh. the girls had went into the neighbor's house yeah 
So Brian went in, into Annie's room and there was a message on the wall in blood and it said, marry me. <laughs> Brian turned round and there was a boy standing there. Oh my God. This boy was wearing a blonde wig. Uh-huh. He had makeup on. Uh-huh. And he had one of Brian's deceased wife's dresses on. Oh my God. And he was holding a hatchet. Oh, that would have been... <laughs> Whoa. So I'm sure you guessed it. The boy was Daniel Lepard yeah, yeah, that Annie went on the date with. Uh-huh. Yeah. So how creepy is that? That's that just very creepy. So there is a struggle, but Daniel managed to get away. He managed to disappear really quickly, mm-hmm. and Brian can understand how. When the police came to investigate, they realised how he had managed to vanish so quickly. Mm-hmm. First of all, they they saw that the messages weren't written in blood. It was actually ketchup. Oh, was it? Right? Yeah. Okay. So. They obviously didn't go and smell the walls or like... No, clearly not. <laughs> oh, admit, I've always thought that if I found sort of blood, that's the kind of thing I'd go and do just in case. <laughs> go lick the wall. <laughs> not lick it, but not smell it. <laughs> not lick the wall. Your daughter would go and lick the oh, wall. She's she obsessed. To. She used to... Oh, that wall. <laughs> With ketchup. Yeah, that's true. She, what, you can say she used to lick the wall. Well, when was... Did she not... <laughs> I think she's done it before. But, uh, but anyway, I, w- I think I would like maybe go and... I don't know if I'd go and smell it. I don't know. Right, shut up. <laughs> I'm just thinking of your daughter licking the walls. <laughs> She does not like walls. <laughs> <laughs> I bet she would if there was ketchup on it. Oh, okay. She does like ketchup. She's obsessed with ketchup. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> I'm just thinking about her looking walls. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't blood, it was ketchup. Uh, they then searched the house to figure out how Daniel managed to get in. So an officer found a hidden crawl space behind a cupboard which was built into the wall of Annie's bedroom. Right. He opened the hatch and found Daniel inside, so they arrested him. Mm-hmm. So they then discovered that he, that Daniel had been living inside the walls of the house. Right. So he had been able to go to other areas of the house and he'd made peepholes so that he could spy on Annie, whichever room that she was in, oh, in the house. No. And he'd been there for two months. Two months? Two months. But was that after they must have started the seance thing then? Yeah. So he must have, I wonder if he actually saw them do that, and then he's like, ooh, now I've got an opportunity to kind of like do the knocking mm. on the walls. Or maybe he'd already been there and he took that opportunity. Then, I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't have the answer to this, but how did he come to f- find places in the house anyway? Like, how how does that even come about? I mean, he doesn't even know the girl mm. originally. They go on one day... Mm. And then somehow he's now in our house and he's found all these little hidey hole things and stuff. And it's like, how do you know. actually come across that? No idea. Especially if they didn't know, if the people that actually live oh, in yeah, the house. they don't even know that. So I mean, yeah. how, how did he discover that? Or No idea. I, and I mean, that's Unless, crazy. can you not like get plans of houses? But why would you do that? No, I mean, like, it just seems a bit... Because he was like 17 at this point, so... Yeah. So just, I just... I just I or just... maybe he came across it by accident because maybe he's broken out of the house... Mm. And somebody's came home and he's had to hide. Mm, maybe. And he's maybe some found it by accident at some yeah, point. Uh, I, I don't just, know. I, it just seems like, you know, I'd love to know the answer of how mm. that actually, how he come about to get into the walls and know that, that the sort of hidey hole existed and, and then all that. So, yeah. Uh, I've, I, have, I don't have the answer, but how creepy is that? That is very creepy. So... Daniel was placed into a juvenile facility until October 1987. So he must have only been there a few months because I'm sure they said that they went on a date sort of January. Mm-hmm. He was in the house for a couple of months, so yeah. that'd be like January, February, March, and then he, he, so he was on a few months. months. Yeah. So, and when he was released, he started robbing houses and he stole two handguns right. from a house. So, so there's quite an issue with him. Juvie obviously didn't. Didn't do any good for him? No. No. Well, yeah, I mean, like, at the end of it, I've, just, I've got a little bit of information about him, uh-huh. um, which I'll get to in a minute. Yeah. Um, on, so, yeah, he stole two handguns. So, on the 1st of December, 1987, so he got out in October, mm-hmm. December, the 1st of December, he broke into a house where the Gustafsson family lived. Uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Mm-hmm. Priscilla Gustafsson who was 33 and pregnant, was in the house at the time with her two children, Abigail and William. Mm -hmm. Priscilla's husband, Andrew, was at work, and when he got home, he found Priscilla lying down on their bed, face down on their bed, sorry, and there was blood all over the pillows. She had been raped and then shot multiple times in the head at point-blank range. 
So Andrew phoned the police, and when they got there, they discovered the bodies of the children. Oh, no. Yeah. William, oh. William who was five, mm. had been drowned in the upstairs bathroom, and Abigail, who was eight, had been drowned in the downstairs bathroom. Oh, that's it's horrendous. That's isn't horrific. It? So the police, I don't know how, but the police connected the murders to Daniel. Right. And there was a manhunt for him, and he was, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> he was found two days later hiding in a dumpster. They found a hair belonging to Abigail on his sock, so that confirmed that yeah. it, was, it was him that done it. So he was sentenced to three life sentences, so mm-hmm. he got... It's like life for each one. Yeah. And in 2017, he appealed for reduce, a reduced sentence, and it was denied. Mm-hmm. So he will spend the rest of his life in jail with no chance of early release. So good. that'll keep you happy. Yes, good, good. <laughs> yeah, so as I said, like I've just got a little bit of information about his childhood. Uh-huh. Um, he was born in 1970 in Townsend, Massachusetts. He had a traumatic childhood. He suffered sexual and psychological abuse by his dad. He would torment Daniel physically, emotionally and sexually on a regular basis. Mm. He struggled with school, both academically and socially. And he was diagnosed with dyslexia at an early age. He hardly had any friends and most of his classmates called him creepy or weird. Right. He was referred to a psychiatrist in his early teens due to abnormal behaviour and the fact that he had poor hygiene and he just didn't take care of his appearance. He was then dis- diagnosed with hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder mm-hmm. and but his psychiatrist started sexually abusing him at his sessions as well. Oh, for goodness sake. I, know. I mean, I don't want to feel sorry for no, him, but I, know. I mean, that's, yeah, but you, that's a professional person that you're supposed to mm-hmm. put your trust in. Uh, and, and his dad. So mm-hmm. you've got your dad, who's like what you know one of the most important people in your life mm-hmm. that you should be able to trust him with yeah. anything. Of course, yeah. And then obviously a person, a professional person. Yeah. But yeah, um, so he started robbing people's houses and he would not only steal things, but he would move things around and admitted that it was purely for the purposes of playing mind games with the owners. Oh. So I have no sympathy for this guy. No. But he did have a shitty childhood. Yeah. But as we've said before, just because you've had a shitty childhood doesn't mean that's no. okay but to you, go. But you do find that a lot of people that commit crimes, etc., generally have some yeah. kind of there's some kind of trauma, trauma yeah. which you know it's obviously a shame for them in their childhood but again you know I mean you can as, I think I've probably said it before as well you can feel sorry for them as a child yeah you, you know that is it is a shame like the poor guy that happened to him but you can't feel sorry for what well, he did no. when he was an adult obviously you can't feel sorry for him then no definitely not but yeah I mean if he hadn't have went through that trauma mm-hmm you then might, I might. would hope that he wouldn't yeah, have not. went down that line and that he wouldn't have done any of that. I, I mean, it's absolutely horrendous what he did to Priscilla mm-hmm. and the family. I know, that's... I mean, Annie and... I mean, that was creepy. Were lu- I mean, that was creepy, but they were lucky yeah. that that's all it was. I mean, I know it was bad enough, but at least, you know, that they didn't get sort of physical with him and... Well, and I anything. think, originally, I'm sure I read that when he was dressed... When Daniel was dressed up in the mother's dress mm-hmm. and the wig and... And he was actually meaning to scare the girls. Yeah, it he wasn't, wasn't expecting the dad. So I don't know what he might have. Well, true. Depending on how they reacted. Yeah, that's true. He might have, because he had a hatchet, he might have hurt them. Yeah. So whatever the situation was, they were lucky. Yeah, they, thankfully not. Uh, yeah, but but for Priscilla, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know why he did it, though. There doesn't seem to be any reason. I mean, yeah. He was, he, yeah, he did the creepy thing with Annie. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, all he was doing was like robbing houses. So why did he go from robbing houses yeah. to rape, rape and murder? I know. Yeah. I don't know, but that have was just... Crazy your, thoughts, crazy minds. That was just your wee quickie for the week. My wee quickie? Yeah. Oh, well, I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Keep Thanks it clean! That. Yeah, sorry, I enjoyed the bonus episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So there you go. So if you would like to follow us on Instagram or Twitter, we are crime underscore divers underscore pod. We have a Facebook page, crime divers podcast. You can email us at crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. You can subscribe to our YouTube, crime divers podcast. And you, if you would like to support the show, um, we have a Patreon page, which is just crime divers podcast. Um, we, we release two bonus episodes a month and we have early access shout outs on the show and prices start from as little as a pound a month 
And if you would like to, if you do like our show, please leave us a review. Yeah, and a rate and subscribe, rate, review. There you go. There we go. Well done. Right, we'll be back soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.